you know, because I have an interesting story to tell here. And it's, it's you know, basically what we're going to do today is I'm going to show how my art progressed and where I came from and where I'm going. Um, basically, I live in New Orleans right now. I moved there in 91. And I'm a glass blowing artist also, and I teach metal to inner city children and adults, you know, whoever signs up. And when I first got to New Orleans, the first thing that really struck me about the city was just the architecture. You know, ju just the strange hodgepodge, you know, of the architecture there. there there's so much Spanish influence and, you know, European. And to me, I, I was like, wow. Because, you know, coming from Austin, Texas, you know, I was looking at Austin, Texas, how it was becoming condos everywhere. And, and it's happening in New Orleans also, but, but the, the infrastructure, you know, the old school infrastructure and the people that built these old churches and everything just, just completely, like, enamored me. So I decided to stay, and that's when I started my career in glass. Uh, before that, I was doing lots of artwork, um, mainly on the street. I would take trash, or at my house, I would take stuff and light it up the lights. <laughs> you know, basically just try to amuse myself and my friends. And, you know, then I got into the world of glass. And all of a sudden, I was like, wow, you know, I can really utilize this in a different way. Um, my sandblasting career started. In the second year, I was at Glassworks. We were having a summer camp, and we had a sandblast. And what we were doing was just painting with Elmer's glue, you know, on mirror or other pieces of glass. So, you know, this particular piece here is that concept that I kind of kept with me along the way. And I'll explain this piece later because, it, you know, it looks kind of uh, intimidating, but it's. You know, and the bitch and everything, but there's actually a story behind that. But as I went on and on, then all of a sudden I was learning glass blowing. I was learning, you know, how to take care of major industrial equipment, and that's what I do now. Right now, I have a 350-pound molten glass furnace coming up. It's about it was at 1,040 degrees when I left. So, you know, I'll be back you know, tomorrow to continue, and then we have, you know, wonderful glass blowing, you know, season after that. We shut down just because we don't want to ruin the equipment. There's there are time when you need to do repairs on that. 2100 degrees will do a lot of damage to any kind of equipment that you're using for that. So, I started out just doing the public art which would be quickly destroyed by city workers or, you know, the police would catch me doing it and I had to run behind the bushes. <laughs> and that was way back in the 80s. I was born in 1970 in Lebanon, Virginia, and followed my dad. He went to LSU. He was actually in the Basketball Hall of Fame. So if you go down there, his name is Thomas Reynolds Fuller. And he, he had a wonderful basketball career there. And he, he's in the oil business. And I never really, you know, was interested in it. So after Baton Rouge, we moved to Dallas, Texas. You know, you know big oil back in the 80s. And uh, I had a hard time with him. He didn't understand me. I didn't understand him. So my art career actually started in the mid-80s as drawing and running away, living on the streets. I was going up and down Greenville Avenue up there and selling like drawn pamphlets of artwork and and poetry you know basically i was a writer for a long time so and it was actually sustaining me i was staying with a girl and her mother that took me in and they kept me for a good couple of years and that's all i would do is take acid and just draw these pictures and do poetry <laughs> so back in the day you know they, now, there's a lot of drug usage and everything, and as I started growing up, you know, through the 90s, I was kind of like, okay, now I have something I can focus my energy on, you know, so my life could have gone in this direction or that direction, but, you know, I chose something that I could concentrate on. So, as I went on and on doing the art, I was using incandescent lights, so a lot of my stuff was 
you know, pretty much, you know, this thick, hanging off the wall. So a lot of these images you would see, you know, would be lit up with the incandescent lights, and they would, you know, be a fire hazard, really. You know, sometimes I would cut Christmas lights up and, you know, put them up and, and uh, you know, hoping uh, I don't start a fire. <laughs> but uh, luckily I didn't. And uh, then I met a guy named Sparky about eight years ago. And he was from Michigan. He worked uh, for, for Detroit. And he was basically Detroit Edison. Uh, let me clarify that. And he introduced me to the whole world of basically green energy. You know, his house, he took me to his house in Sutton's Bay up there. He had a nice mansion right on Sutton's Bay. And, you know, with the boat launch and everything. And he was really interested, you know, I guess he saw potential, you know, because he saw that I was working, I was actually producing, you know, I'm not someone who's going to say, hey, I'm going to do this, and then it's not done, you know. So he invested a lot of energy and a lot of knowledge into teaching me, you know, LED. And it, it really changed everything in my heart because. At that point, I was like, wow, you know, now I can, you know, sideline stuff and, and make it more interesting and also be sustainable. Like, if I sell something to the client, they don't have to open the back and change the light bulbs out all the time. So that really, you know, that helped out a lot. I mean, and this guy invested a lot of energy. And so Sparky moved on. He worked for FEMA. He, he did the whole Katrina thing and was up in New York for a little while. There were some major floods up there in the Northeast. And right now he's kind of disappeared off the face of the earth. I don't know where he went. He sold his mansion and, but he, you know, he taught me a lot. And the mirror that I used to do, sandblast a lot, the LEDs kind of changed that. Uh, I felt like I could take it to another level. Uh, I, I, I was a photographer forever and felt like, you know, how do I photo something and play on its own now? So in the beginning, I was using transparency paper and, you know, whatever I could find I could print on that I could show light through. And went on and on until a friend told me about this product called Rapid Mask. And you, you can look it up online. But what you basically do is take a photograph and you can basically print it on a special paper and you need an exposure unit. And through that special paper, you are blasting UV light onto another material. And on that other material, you have to peel the back, put it on the glass, and then let it rest. You know, it takes me about, ju just to do the image itself, it takes me about six hours. And you have to really understand photography. E every photo is different. If a DPI or, you know, any sort of uh, resolution is off a little bit, you know, I have to really pay attention to that in order to make the photo work. And after that, I'll take it to the art industrial sandblaster and blast the image. So if you look close at these images later, you will see like little bitty pixels. So the material is really, really sensitive. And I have to use, and what I'm using is aluminum oxide. Aluminum oxide is the smallest sandblasting particle you can use. I'm not just throwing clay sand in there. I have to use something really small and pay attention to the pressure and all that in order to then just come alive on the glass. So, after that, then I will build a frame, and usually, usually I have a pretty good idea of what frame I'm going to build for each piece, of course, uh, depending on the glass. Um, luckily, I ran into a company in New Orleans who were doing skyscrapers and had a multitude, thousands of pieces of glass that they just wanted to get rid of. They were going to just throw it in the trash. And I felt like, wow, you know, I mean, don't do that. <laughs> so I have, you know, I have storage units full of glass. You know, it's amazing. 
So what I'll do is basically build a frame. This one on my basic frame. This one's not as fancy as you know someone can get. But I'll basically take two pieces of plywood, and depending on whether it's one pane of glass or two, I will wrap them for the lies. And I'm using these really cool diodes. They're rated for six years staying on. So I've never had a client complain, complain that I like them. Um, transformers are definitely necessary. Um, to not electricity from your, you know, your 110 from your outlet to 12 volt, um, you have to have a transformer. So, you know, that, that was the only thing I didn't like. But, you know, it, in the end, I'm like doing people a favor. I'm using very little electricity here to run all of this. So, um, oh, always be conscious, I guess. <laughs> and uh, so if any of you guys have any questions, you know, please, I'll go ahead and take them. It'll be much more interesting to me to answer questions and talk. You can use a battery now. You, you'll be changed, and work up with the battery pack. You know, I, you know, I, maybe in the same place. Thicker frame. Hmm. Thicker frame. Thicker frame, right? But I like the closeness to the wall of these pieces, oh, um, wow. rather than right. always being like three or four inches away. You know. That, that, that was a battle I went through, and I have made pieces with batteries, and they just, the, the batteries don't last that long. They really don't. So. A nice cut cell phone battery, like, like battery. I could go in that direction, yeah. I mean, I, I, maybe so in the future, yeah. <laughs> you know, I do do commissions, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you want a cell phone battery, I'm gonna be, I will make it. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely, I, I've done many, many commissions, and, you know, I definitely take care of the customer, and, you know, any time I give you a piece of a 10-year warranty, so, you know, I guarantee you nothing's going to happen to any of these. It doesn't fall off That's more. <laughs> yeah, good writing, actually. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> All right, I'm going to hide back here. Yeah, kill him. All right. At the point where you're actually sandblasting, mm -hmm. are you are you working on like brush stroke scale, or are you doing the whole frame at once? Well, the the frame won't be in there. I mean, you just know, the, the glass. Whole, the whole image. Yeah, the, the, the whole image. Large. I'm backlining it so that I can actually see what I'm sandblasting. It's it's really odd when you're doing this type of sandblasting. If you don't have backlight, you can't really see. What pixels you're blowing up, and as you go along, you know, like these areas are left on purpose because I like the texture. But you know, if, if this had to be a perfect picture of that church, you know, I would have to pay major attention to how I was sandblasting. Yeah. So. Oh, I was going to say, the, uh, the nozzle on your sandblast, is it like a, a little mini torch? So, I mean, you know, you a... Kind of, yeah. It, it, they're novels, and, you know, they taper off at the end. And sometimes I use a big novel, you know, which would be maybe that big around, like a nickel. And then sometimes I'm using, you know, something maybe the size of a pinhead, okay. you know, it, it, depending on what I'm doing, yeah. you know. So you definitely, you have options out there to, Depending on what effect you're trying to get. A lot of times if I use the small nozzles, I'm going for, you know, texture. You know, so I can take glass too and also texturize it. You know, I've done a lot of deep carvings in, in the past and everything. And so that was a, you know, that's an option. Like, I, I especially paid attention here to Felicity Methodist Church. You know, I really wanted to emphasize that in the bricks up here. You know, the, the bricks up here were, stood out to me when I'm looking at it, you know, visually from the street. And, you know, so, so I used many of those techniques on each piece, you know, to try to, uh, I don't know, this is the way I envision that church, you know, walking by at night, you know, 
And now they have stained glass up here that a friend of mine did. And, you know, I haven't taken a picture since, but... And I've traveled around, you know, a lot. Like, if I, if I see something interesting, you know, I'll stop and, you know, say, hey, I gotta take a picture. And I've gotta... Somehow I've gotta, like, portray what I saw and thought, you know, in my mind, you know, at that particular moment. So, it's a lot of fun. I mean, being an artist is fun, and it's also hard, you know. You, you basically are spending all your money that you make, you know, making other artists happy. And then, and then you're like, and then, and then you're like, you know, you're hauling stuff in U-Hauls and, you know, whatever. And, I, you know, I just, I just really enjoy what I do and, you know, feel like it's necessary. You know, I, I, I just enjoy life so much now, you know, I've been clean for 13 years. And, you know, one, <laughs> you know one, one, once I like found something to focus on, I'm like, bam, I'm going to hit that hard. Yeah. Would you talk a little bit more about the dragonfly piece? How it's so evocative and is that really sure. my interest? Yeah, this one was a fun piece because not only did I sandblast, and x-ray of a butterfly, or you know, I'm a dragonfly, sorry. Um, but I also added live ferns behind the piece. And this is about a two-year-old piece, and it's still evolving. So as it continues to, all the moisture and everything, it's going to etch this glass. So it's actually going to change over time, you know, as it sits on the wall. So it's kind of fun to watch it from when I first did it to now, and you know, what that is to cost people. <laughs> you know? well, it's a living, breathing entity. Exactly. And, and I mean, some of it is actually still green, you know, so I'm like, wow, this has like been in here for two years, and it's still evolving, and, and you can live inside of this, and... You're giving it life. It's a plant. That's true. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's plenty of moisture, you know, down here in the south. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> now, some of these, like, we'll, we'll look over here. To see. Um, these are a lot of fun. These are two pane glass. So, I've actually taken two panes of glass and put them together, smacked them together really good, and added. You know, different layers of lights. That, that's a lot more router. And when I did this one, it was scary because I didn't have a router table yet. So I'm holding on to a router. And I had a router on both sides. And I could have messed myself up pretty good. But uh, so I routed for the lights. And I'm really into this texture. I want to do like four or five layers. You know, I, I want to really do some really 3D stuff. And, and I'm working on that right now. I have stuff in the studio that I'm working on that uh, are gonna be incredible and really complicated. So uh, I'm spending a lot of time on that, trying to figure that out. Same with the uh, bad graveyard piece here. It makes a really cool effect if you do it correct. And I discovered this on accident, but if you walk back and forth, it does this really cool hologram due to the pixels that you're using. And, you know, that is also going to be another uh, another session of uh, new works that I'll be working on. <laughs> this one, if you put on 3D glasses, actually goes 3D, yes. And this was an intense piece I was doing place called Trouser House on Rampart in New Orleans. Uh, they were having a big show over there and they were looking for kind of intense type, you know, material. Um, this is a picture that changed the laws in the United States over fire skates and the safety of fire skates. This poor young lady was stuck in an apartment building up on a fire escape with this child. And as soon as the fireman stepped on the fire escape,
it, it collapsed. And this photographer from, and this is not my uh, picture, but the photographer was snapping just the weirdest time. And what, what happened was this lady fell to her death. She died like the next day. But the child had bounced off of her and survived. I mean, <laughs> that's a miracle. Like, like this piece, yeah, you know, means a lot to me. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. This is Driftwood from Michigan. <laughs> yeah, I kind of had into the piece in uh, an old car from 1800. And just some cherry wood. I don't get that together. You know, that, that was a fun show. How am I going to do it? Uh, I won't be in prison. Yeah, like I, I don't really need booze. Yeah, and it's a lot of fun, you know, at my job where I'm at, you know, teaching children. I mean, we, we get school groups of like 30 or 40 kids, and, you know, I'll sit there and narrate to them. I have a mic, you know, like Madonna. And <laughs> 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 I just throw glass at them. <laughs> I just wonder the thickness of the glass you use. Sometimes I use quarter inch, and then sometimes I use you know eighth inch, depending on the effect of it. On what I use. When you do the layering, are you going to use a thinner glass? No, with the layering, I really like to stick to quarter inch because in order to have lights going in, you know, two different pieces of glass. Oh, you put the lights between the glass. It's actually a side light. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's what made you know using LEDs inside because if I back back to it everything, this wouldn't even be possible. You know, I wouldn't be able to you know get really crisp and cool images onto the glass because you can see a light behind. You know, with the mirror you can do that. You know, I would sandblast the back and then. Now, I wish I had more examples of, of the mirror stuff, but I sold them all, so <laughs> I couldn't bring them here. But um, yeah, it's really nice. What I'll do is I'll sandblast the back and then the front. And what that does is if you put a light in front of it, you see this reflection, but you're not seeing a mirror reflection. So it, yeah, that's, that was, that's a whole fun process that, that I'm also had several pieces in, in progress. I've now found a new mixture of blues that is wonderful. I, I just kept mixing blues, mixing blues to see what would actually work. And I'm actually painting on here now and doing some really cool designs. And while we're on that subject, we're talking about this piece. Uh, the Audubon Hotel on St. Charles Avenue in about 93, uh, Clinton Peltier, who was an art connoisseur, got, got the highest award ever presented by the CAC over there, met me, and I showed him some of my art, and he was like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, you know, like, I want you to decorate the Audubon Hotel. So, I went over there, and they had huge doorways, uh, a little smaller than this, but I built huge pieces that went around the doorways. I put like six sconces. I was in the middle of doing his windows. And his partner was John Spradlin, who owned the Red Room. And that's the part of that Eiffel Tower that's on St. Charles. He, he owned that and had a, had a wonderful like swing club over there. So these two guys like really just took me under their wing. I, I lived at the Audubon Hotel for two years for as I built all this stuff. And unfortunately, Clinton had an aneurysm and died. And 
then all of a sudden I was kind of in a situation where I was like, wow, I've got all this invested in this. And, you know, it, it was really nice with him because, you know, he just gave me freedom to do whatever I wanted to do. If, if I had an idea, it was just like, how much money do you need? You know? And, you know, I was always fair. You know, I never, because uh, I was living for free. And then I was bar backing there and bartending on Sundays, which was a nice slow day. And I met a lot of interesting people there. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, after he passed, I kind of put a break on, you know, producing, like, really, really cool work. Now, uh, after that happened, I had to move out, of course, and I went back to Austin for a short period of time. I had, I had a whole bunch of shows up there. I, I took everything with me I could bring, and I just showed a, a Texture, Love Joys, uh, Spider House, all, all, the, all these places still exist over there, and it had some really neat shows. And a friend calls me, and he's like, dude, they're tearing, they're gutting the Audubon, you know, you need to come get your stuff. And I was just like, man, there's no way I'm going to go over there. So I don't know what happened to it, but there was a whole conglomerate of people. I suspect somebody has the work. <laughs> I've been storing it somewhere. Um, yeah, I, I just couldn't see how they, you know, would have left it there. And now the sign, this is the original sign to Audubon Restaurant, which was torn down before Katrina. Um, you know, with it from storm damage and everything. And... A friend of mine was just driving up the street, and he was like, oh my god, oh my god, he's got to have this. So, you know, he scored it out of the dumpster. They, they were just going to throw it away, too. And so, I was kind of like, all right, Audubon, Audubon Hotel. <laughs> it's like a light bulb went on. So, anyway, so, so I did this pretty much for Clinton, because, you know, he was a guy, you know, that absolutely had 100% faith in me, trust in me, and, you know, and just gave me freedom. Yeah. You know, now I spend all my money, everything I make, <laughs> you know, just trying to keep producing, you know, I, I, I get bored, you know, if I, if I don't do something, um, you know, I'll probably end up back on drugs, you know. So, you know, always, you know, I know all you guys, I've already probably been able to do some pretty tough stuff, but no, but the, the main thing is, is that having something to focus on really, really just, you know, can save your life, you know. So, I'm standing in testimony for that. <laughs> what is your glass blowing like? Is that jewelry? Uh, no. No. <laughs> No, I do, when I glass blow, I make really interesting paperweights. And I didn't bring anything. And, and I do have pieces where, like, sort of like this one, where there's a Florida Lee, you know, up in the top behind glass. I, I have pieces I've done with my art, like, lit from below. And, I mean, I, you know, I really, glass blowing is, quite a, there's so many glass blowers in New Orleans. So most of them, what they want to do is make flowers and goblets, you know, these wonky goblets and flowers and stuff. And to me, I'm like, okay, there's already enough of them. So where am I going to sell those? What I'm going to do is go to a market and there's going to be a guy over here or a girl over there selling the same thing. And that's how they make their major money, is make these little things that don't take that long and pop, 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 25, 25, 25, 25. And then they use that money to fund their, you know, major pieces. Now, to me, that's just boring. I, I don't want to take boxes of stuff to a flea market and set up all this stuff just to make, you know, blah, 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 blah. Because I have a daytime job. And I don't want to compete with these people. I respect them. And, but I see what they're doing, you know. And I can use the glass blowing facility for free. You know, I can sneak in at like 11 o'clock at night and just light up a glory hole and you know, start making work. And around New Orleans, it's kind of a small town like this, in a sense. Um, the, the arts district, 
So the stuff that I make, even though I'll incorporate it into my art sometimes, it's all over the city already. Um, you know, if I focused all my energy on that, I wouldn't be able to make these. So, you know, it's a give or take thing. You know, I decided this is what I really wanted to do with photography and, and lighting and boxes and just interesting stuff to look at that you could go anywhere and see a floppy bowl or Chihuly. Yeah. You know, Chihuly to me, I work with his team. Chihuly doesn't even blow glass because he had an accident and lost an eye. And his crew comes to me and uses my furnace, you know, during the regular year. And I don't want to compete with those people either. You know, I let them do what they do and they have their little niche. So, you know, I respect that from afar. And so rarely do I use my glass blown objects, you know, in pieces. Just to stay out of the uh, glass of I just make it happen for everybody else. Yeah. Sure. Um, when you sandwich two pieces together, the glass, have you ever cut the edge to follow the form, the shape of whatever you um, glass it onto that surface? If I'm doing deep etching, yes. Like if, if I purposely wanted to deep etch, yes, not have done many pieces like that. Yeah. And then when you add the LED, will it create a streak of color on that edge? Yes. Mm. Yeah, and especially, uh, I had a piece that sold a while back, but I had deep etched behind it and made like basic bubbles. So, and that was my sexy angle. I was going to show you all like a video <coughs> of a, <coughs> of, a uh, of a documentary they did on me, but I didn't want to bore you all with that. <laughs> but, no, but, uh, the, the sexy the sexy angel was really cool. That was, that was a piece that was a half round, like these two. And I really deep etched through the back. So I had two layers of light. So, you know, where I deep etched, it was picking up light from the front lights and, you know, a lot of light from the back. And I'm also working on some of those. So you know, those will be exciting. And, you know, I'm hoping I'll be back here you know, maybe in a year or two, there's quite a waiting list here, but, you know, I'm hoping, uh, you know, I'll bring all these stuff for you guys to see. Mm -hmm. Is that the yacht not tell us about it, not shows? What's that? So the yacht not tell us about it, not shows. Oh, I have yeah. surprises. <laughs> I have surprises. I've been playing with neon, and trust me, I have an arsenal. <laughs> Yeah, I will get bored doing the same thing over and over again very quickly. When's your birthday? July 26th. Me and Mick Jack are partying together. I share my birthday with Mick Jack. What's that? And my mother. Oh, okay. Wow. That's awesome. Well, me, you, and your mother are going to get together next July 26th. <laughs> That would be just incredible. <laughs> so cool, any thoughts? Uh, what is y'all's take on what you're seeing here? Like, like what, what do you see? What, what uh, makes you mad? What, what uh, makes you glad? What, like, what do you, what, you know, I'm always, makes me I'm mad always interested, you know. I, guess, <laughs> I, can, I can go to an opening and just, you know, be there and talk. You know, it's blah 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 all about me. Like well, it was my first one of my first ideas, this would be great for deaf people yes. to make a little bell that flashes. Yes. Okay. Without being, you know, conspicuous bowl right. or something. reinforced. Yeah. Absolutely. Because when we did input testing, mm -hmm. and you know, they you do visually reinforced audiometry. There's okay. a little monkey that lights up and does a little thing. Okay. when they stare at a particular feel in the sound suite. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah I mean, absolutely. I, I'm open to anything like that. Uh, and it would be so edifying for a person with yeah. sensory loss. Oh, really? yes. Something that yes. alerts the deaf person. Let them know their favorite, whatever's coming on. Or, <laughs> <I don't> know. <laughs> sure. Uh, Taco <laughs> Mac. 
iPads or whatever. I like that. You know, I, I'll, I'll do pretty much everything. I mean, <laughs> like I said, commissions are available. To keep yourself out of the No, but, you know, like I, I, I teach inner city kids. I mean, you could do a myself. internet market on that. Oh, right. absolutely. I, I, I teach the inner city kids myself, and, you know, at, at first they're scared of me, and then, like, you know, by the end of the day, they're like, Uncle Drake, you know, I mean, I, I love it. Because of the hair that scares them. <laughs> <laughs> they're just like, uh, and I have tattoos all over, so, you yeah. know, you know, first so, I guess I'm a little intimidating, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but, um, you know, at the end, it, it, it's, it's all fun, mm -hmm. and, and that, that really edifies you know, myself, you know, as far as, you know. They recognize this. Yeah, they recognize this all. When you start your process, do you have the photograph first, or do you go take the photograph when you have a vision in mind? Most of them, I have the photograph. I've taken them. And, and I'll definitely, if I see something, you know, I'll be like, I want a photograph of that. So the photographs first, mm -hmm. the end of the Yeah, you have to have the photograph in order to uh, expose it on to the... You know, special matte paper. How about portraits? Do you have to do any kind of portraits? Like Done that? many. Done many. I do, I, I, like, Charmaine Neville, I did, you know, her, one of her sons who just got married a couple of years ago. And she wanted me also to do a special one for a friend of hers. Um, she only had one photo left of one of her sons. And so Damien, uh, the one that went to prison for supposedly killing somebody, and he didn't. Um, you know, him and I talked, and I ended up doing that, you know, for Charmaine. So, a perfect photograph, just perfect, you know. And it was the only picture she had left after Katrina. Everything else had just gotten so wet. So, I took the one remaining picture that was kind of damaged, and I immortalized it. So, during the wedding, you know, it was a gift. And that, that was a lot of fun because, you know, she was, she went through a lot during Katrina and, you know, so it was, you know, it was exciting and, you know, I got to hang out with her house and she was, she was just in normal <laughs> clothes, you know, she wasn't all, you know, she had a rag on her head and, you know, when, when we had a photograph together, she was like, man, if my mom was still alive and saw, <laughs> saw me just wearing a rag on my head, she would beat me up. <laughs> <laughs> And Damien's just there with no shirt on and just chilling, you know. And yeah, yeah, that was a, that was a great. But yes, I do, I do photographs. I can take, you know. Short photographs would be great. Yeah, now polar uh, like uh, Polaroids, like old photos, are really hard to work with because what I'll have to do is scan them in a scanner and try to up the DPI and resolution, but. So they always come out a little strange, but you know, if it's a digital picture, like 300 DPI or better, um, I can do a perfect, you know, image of it. Yeah, the historic photograph is already great. Yeah, it's CBS. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, mean, I know Photoshop pretty good. I mean, I can, yeah. Yeah, you need Photoshop to do this and, and be avid at it because, Yeah. I mean, I have to have a, a bitmap done correctly, and you know, and then of course the size and, and everything done absolutely correctly, or it won't work. Like I destroyed, man, I spent probably four thousand dollars just figuring this material out. They had a uh, class for it up in the Northeast at a glass studio, and there was a dropout rate of about. 89% of people just couldn't grasp it because unless you understand that each photograph is different and you have to make adjustments for that, some people get it, some people don't, and most of them don't. And so I, I thought this was fun because I was like, no one else is doing this. I mean, you know, especially, you know, in New Orleans, maybe up in New York I would have some competition, you know, but, you know, it was fun for me. I just wanted to do something different. You know, and, that, and that's exactly why, you know, the glass blowing is not such a big deal to me. You know, it's like, I've done that. You know, 25 years I've done that. You know, you know I wanted something different. You know. 
I'm a little disappointed that there's no self-portrait. I have some. Well, we are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just dangle that character right there. Dangle that there. Have you ever experimented with any kind of a medium that actually can interact with electricity and produce light, like phosphor or a floor? Well, I have a piece of neon over here. Uh, it, it would transfer, and I don't know what the substance would be, but the surface mm -hmm. of the art where you've trans transferred an image then can be electrified and it, 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 it emits. Well, they actually have that. Substance. They actually yeah. have that. It's, an, it's a uh, LCD mm -hmm. display thing. Mm -hmm. And they use it in office buildings a lot. Like, if, if they have a small office and they want to make it look bigger, there's full panes of glass that can go all the way across the wall and show you like another part of the building that, that doesn't exist. I mean, they are doing that, you know. It, it's, I, I saw that technology and it's so expensive. Like, and you know, basically you need a computer, you know, on that thing 24-7, you know, to make it happen. And I don't know how many laptops I could afford. But, that's... <laughs> Um, the Audubon Hotel was probably, yeah, that's the only one here, um, but I did. But a lot of times when I would, you, you know, erect street art, it would just be totally just thrown in the trash by, you know, by city workers. So, I mean, even if, yeah, and I never took pictures back then. I mean, this was before, like, digital cameras, you know, yeah. where, you know I couldn't afford one. You know, like cell phones were like this big. Yeah. You, know, you, know, you had a backpack. You know, but, you know so it was like, yeah, I, man, I missed so many sculptures. And I spent a lot of time on them, too. I mean, there was a lot of times, like, I would start one and I'd see, like, how it's done. So I'd go hide and come back out and bring out something else that I found. And uh, some of them were just incredible, you know. I mean, I, I just, I miss those days in a way. You know, but it wasn't making me, you know, money so I could produce more. Right. You know, nowadays, uh, you know, this technology is very expensive. Um, you know, my lights for a hundred of them are like 260 bucks. And uh, I, I buy the expensive ones because I never want them to burn out. I, I don't want somebody calling me. And, 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 and uh, you know, usually with these, uh, the one thing that will go out you know, in like six years, is and the way you know is if all the lights are not on and that lights out, you need a new transformer. And you, you can buy transformers at Radio Shack, where, wherever. Um, I like these big boxy ones because I can choose how long I want my wire. If I use a Radio Shack one, it's going to come with a little plug, you know, a little funnel plug, and it only goes to so, um, I like these, and they actually stopped making these just recently. So, you know, if one of these went out, um, there is a company working to bring them back. And I'm very happy because these are the old coil transformers. They'll outlast your radio track little black, you know, wall board. That's what I like to call them. <laughs> but <laughs> um, they have lots of copper wrapped up in there. and. This is old school. This is what lasted, but people didn't like the size of it. And I'm old school. I I prefer to stick with what works. You know, I don't want to buy a cheap transformer and have it go out you know, in a couple of months. So that's just me. <laughs> well, man, I I really thank all you guys for coming out. I mean, this is great. You know, this is a nice happy birthday. Thank you for bringing y'all with you. Oh, no problem. No, it's always a pleasure. So, um, any final questions? Oh, what, what, what were we at on time? We got time? Okay, we're good. Yeah, um, so I'm going to consider all of you guys a critic. Let, let me know what you think about my art. I'm going to start with you. That's me. Thank you. That's that dragonfly. Yeah, dragonfly is a good thing. I'm, I'm a mule fan. 
You're a meal fan? Oh, yeah. And I got that guy at his best in Buckingham Palace. Yeah, the, the piece she was referring to, and I love this. I, I, there was a fascinating cat show at a huge gallery in New Orleans. And so everybody came in there, and they were being so serious about these fascinating cats. There was people like doing fabric, and some people even did like sugar sculptures, mm -hmm. and you know, a fascinator hats. And I was like, you know, looking at what, what was coming in already, and I was like, hmm, you know, I want to do something a little, and so this is right when Beatrice had the word away, you know, and I was, I was like, man, wouldn't that be cool if there was a donkey and donkey in <laughs> 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 Buckingham Palace ballroom with Beatrice's hat <laughs> on? So that, that's a show of a lot of, uh, you know, Photoshop work and superimposing. <laughs> and that was the first time I'd ever did that. M most of the time I would just, you know, take a photograph and that was it, you know. But, um, oh my God, and it was a big hit too. Yeah. It's freaking awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, because people were just like looking at all this serious stuff and then they get the cookies. <laughs> just start rolling. And I just got the biggest kick out of that, you know. I was like, wow, man, I nailed that one. <laughs> and then, I, you know, I took it down after the show. It was a month long show. And I, I took it down and brought it to the house and just kind of hid it in the corner. But um, a, a lady came by my house and bought a piece. And when I showed that to her, she she couldn't decide between the piece she bought and that one. She was just like, she was like, you need to put that back in a gallery somewhere. Because because I kind of felt like, okay, this is my joke piece. It's not gonna sell, but you know, everybody will be happy. Yeah, you know, as long as I can make some people laugh. I mean, it, it, they needed it. The, the show was too tense. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was out of control. Well, thank you again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you guys have been great.